Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, so this is our uh, tenth lecture for the Provost Lecture Series. So, so it marks um, a, a great milestone. And uh, so I will let um, um, Evan to introduce uh, Professor Yabin Chi. But before we do that, I just want to uh, quickly uh, remind everyone, so during the Q&A, so we, we placed a couple uh, speaker, uh, speaker phones at the, uh, at the front of the row, so if you have any questions, please come forward. And uh, so uh, since we, we do not have enough. And uh, so let me just um, quickly showcase um, the Provost Lecture Series, what's the purpose? We started in November uh, 2000, uh, 22, so about a year ago, and uh, so the lecture provides a, a great opportunity only for OIS faculty members to celebrate their milestones, such as uh, being promoted uh, uh, to associate or full professors with tenure, uh, and also to celebrate those who received awards. And so you can see kind of a wide range of uh, uh, posters here and showing uh, our faculty members and with very different disciplines. And so today, so, so I'm very happy that uh, so Professor Yabin Chi will present his work to celebrate uh, several uh, significant awards he received in the past couple years. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, um, all of you and many of you who are not here uh, for the support, including um, people from the Office of the Provost, and also people from CPR, and also people from the core facilities, especially from the engineering section, Patrick Kennedy, and also we have a, a new recruit, Chad, uh, uh, Chad Sword, from a, a core facility, so we just recently recruited him uh, in the machine shop. Uh, so um, also, for um, the next few months, we, have secured three speakers. Professor Takahashi is going to retire by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so we will uh, celebrate uh, his retirement on February 1st. And also Prof Professor Satoshi Mitarai was promoted to full professor recently. And uh, his lecture is already decided on March 21st. And uh, also probably Professor Kashef Dani at the end of March. And we have several more professors who have been promoted, so they will be kind of lined up starting the fiscal year 2024. So that's all from me. I will hand this to Evan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Amy. So it's my, my great honor to introduce Professor Yabing Chi and his, uh, um, for his provost lecture. Uh, so, yeah, Bing, I think you all know pretty well that the Chi unit is one of the real powerhouses here at OIST and has been one of the most um, you know, successful units in the past decade here in terms of doing a lot of science and very high impact science and making an impact. It's also, uh, of course, their, their research is very important for uh, the sustainability of um, our planet and the materials that can help us achieve our sustainability goals. So uh, from that perspective, uh, Yabing is going to be uh, even more important to the future of OIST and, and making sure that OIST is contributing on a global stage to solving uh, humanity's great problems. So, uh, so just to introduce Yabing a, a bit, he, he got his bachelor's from uh, Nanjing University in 2000. Uh, went on to get a, a master's at Hong Kong University uh, after that and did a PhD at Berkeley where he graduated in 2008. Uh, he did a, a few years as a postdoc at Princeton um, before coming to OIST uh, in 2011 and setting up the Energy Materials and Surface Science Unit. And uh, since then has, has done lots of different uh, projects and research which I'm sure we'll we'll hear about, including one project on ants, just letting you know that. Um, the, uh, we actually did a, a small collaboration, but um, recently he's, as, as Amy says, has, has been raking in many honors, uh, including the uh, Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 2019, for the last several years has been a, um, 
recognized as a highly cited researcher, so one of the top, very top 1% uh, uh, of, of cited researchers in the world. Um, he won an award from the Cow Foundation in 2022. And then this past year, in 2023, became a fellow of the Materials Research Society, a very prestigious honor, and also um, a fellow of um, the Science and Technology of Materials, Interfaces, and Processing Society, also called ABS, uh, so ABS Fellowship, uh, and, and many others as well. So his work has been cited over 20,000 times uh, and is being cited uh, you know, on the scale of 4,000 times a year. So very impressive uh, impact that the research that is going on here at, at OIS. So uh, we're very proud to have him here on our faculty and looking forward to hearing today about his research. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's welcome Yabing. So um, yeah, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank Amy for giving me this opportunity to give this talk here. It's wonderful. Uh, 10 is a very good number, OK? <laughs> and also would like to thank uh, Evan for the nice introduction. Yeah, just a small uh, correction. I got my master's degree from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a different university. Yeah, I just want to clarify. And uh, yeah, today I'm going to share with you our research findings. Uh, about surface sciences and provoscite solar cells, uh, which have been uh, our main research focus of our unit. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to give a few acknowledgements. And first of all, I would like to really give all the thanks to uh, the members in my unit, as well as our collaborators. Today, I see many of the unit members are actually sitting in the audience. Thank you for your long time support, okay? And uh, also, I would like to thank the strong support from OIST in the past more than 10 years, uh, including many, uh, I would say, uh, innovative uh, funding uh, program, uh, such as IND cluster research program, as well as proof of concept program. Also, last but uh, not least, I would like to thank some public funding uh, from the uh, Kagenki and uh, also JST STEP research grants. Today, uh, my talk will consist of three parts. Uh, first, I will introduce the background and the purpose for this research. Then, I will provide uh, several examples of our surface science studies on metal halide provoscites, which have been a class of new materials with a strong potential for solar cell applications. Towards the end, I would like to briefly discuss a few examples to illustrate how we can uh, utilize our surface science uh, fundamental research findings into the solar cell applications. Now let's start with the first part. So uh, global warming, as everyone knows, has become a grand challenge facing the human society. It has led to many changes and consequences, and some of which are just happening in our neighborhood. To uh, illustrate how global warming is impacting our local environment in Okinawa, I would like to uh, mention the specific example of coral bleaching. So here is a, a, a photo of our beautiful campus. On top of the photo here, uh, we can see the ocean. Ocean in Okinawa is quite unique in a sense. It is also the habitat for the largest uh, coral reef uh, community in this region. When you go to the seaside, you will see these uh, coral uh, reefs which consists of a variety of different uh, corals with uh, uh, very beautiful colors and uh, very, very interesting shapes. And uh, sponges and algae and many types of fish, which are representing an uh, incredible diversity of marine uh, ecosystem in Okinawa. But this has been drastically changing as a result of the uh, uh, global warming. Global warming uh, can lead to the rise of ocean water temperature. When the water temperature rises above a certain level, it causes these uh, corals to turn completely white. This phenomenon is called coral bleaching. According to a survey conducted in 2017, more than half of uh, coral reefs close to Okinawa had died as a result of coral bleaching, which, as you can imagine, has a tremendous negative impact on the marine ecosystem 
uh, around Okinawa. So the essential question for everyone to answer is how can we achieve sustainable development and environmental conservation at the same time? And this is also the purpose of our research. To mitigate the negative impact of the global warming while still keep the uh, sustainable economic growth, it is essential to develop the clean, sustainable energy and uh, to reduce the uh, carbon footprint. So the goal of our research is to um, develop so-called zero net energy building, that is 100% self-sustainability, zero CO2 emission. To achieve this goal, we plan to develop novel low-cost, high-efficiency solar cells, batteries, and lighting devices. So the goal here is to develop novel low-cost energy-related devices. Such energy device uh, application uh, research is carried out in our energy device lab, which is equipped with a full line of the fabrication tools and colorization tools. On the other hand, uh, equally important, there's another line of research which is at the heart of our approach. That is, we also perform fundamental research in our surface science and advanced colorization lab to understand better the structure and property relationships of energy materials, we then apply these findings from our fundamental research to guide our energy device applications. Due to the uh, time constraint uh, today, uh, I will only focus on our solar cell studies. In this slide, I would like to provide some information about the history of solar cell development. Uh, this uh, chart here shows the evolution of best research cell efficiency for various types of solar cells as a function of time. Not all the solar cells can be mass produced at a low cost. Here I would like to uh, highlight a few important solar cells which can be suitable for the large uh, scale deployment. Uh, roughly speaking, um, so far uh, researchers have worked on three generations of the solar cells the first generation solar cell is the crystalline silicon cell. Uh, its efficiency uh, increased at a relatively fast rate uh, between 70s and 90s last century. Then it experienced a stagnation period for almost 30 years. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the efficiency has started uh, increasing again since 2015 and reached a record high efficiency of about 26% as of today. These uh, crystalline silicon cells uh, has excellent uh, efficiency and also superb uh, endurance, but it is relatively expensive to make, especially in the early stage of its development. So to reduce the fabrication cost, uh, researchers have been developing the second generation of solar cell with uh, silicon thin film cell as the representative. Thin film silicon cell can be made at a lower cost, but it also suffers from uh, low uh, efficiency of about 14%, um, which is about half of the crystalline silicon cells. So to achieve the high efficiency and also the uh, lower fabrication cost, the third generation of solar cells uh, have been developed with the Provoskite solar cell as its most prominent uh, representative. Over the past decades, Provoskite solar cell has been intensively studied uh, with its record high efficiency now exceeding 26%. So here I put all these three curves together for you get a, a direct comparison. It is very clear, as you can see, a Provoskite solar cell has the most rapid increase in its efficiency, making it a strong contender for the next generation solar cells. For any solar cell technology, there are three important parameters uh, forming the so-called golden triangle. Uh, fabrication cost, efficiency, and lifetime combine together to determine the overall cost to utilize the solar cell uh, technology. Now let's uh, examine Provoskite solar cell in the context of these three important parameters. Uh, first of all, over the past 14 years, the efficiency of Provoskite solar cell has increased from the initial 3.8% reported by Professor Miyasaka in his 2009 Jax paper 
to nowadays exceeding 26%, uh, which is already on par with even the best crystalline silicon cell. While a uh, crystalline silicon cell requires expensive and also energy-intensive uh, processing to fabricate, Provoskai solar cell can take advantage of many low-cost fabrication methods. But Provoskai solar cell is still facing a key challenge. That is, these cells often suffer from fast degradation and a relatively short lifetime. And this is a key issue currently under intensive investigation by many research groups, including ourselves. So here in this slide, I would like to uh, briefly introduce the major instrument we use for our uh, research works. Here is a photo of the ultra-high vacuum system in our lab. It has a base pressure of 10 to the minus 10 tor, which provides a desirable clean environment for us to perform the atomic scale in situ studies. The scanning tunneling microscopy tool on the left-hand side of the ultra-high vacuum system enables us to determine the atomic uh, structures of the uh, materials. And uh, the spectroscopy tools on the right-hand side of our UHV system uh, can help us understanding better the material properties. So here we can establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between atomic scale structures and their material properties. Also, our UHV system is equipped with a multiple vacuum evaporators, which can be uh, used for in situ deposition of a thin film samples. Here in this slide, I would like to introduce the uh, operation principles for scanning tunneling microscopy. And uh, this slide actually was made by uh, my former PhD student, Afshan. I thank her for allowing me to use this slide. So in uh, STM experiments, we first prepare a uh, clean, atomically flat, uh, conductive uh, sample. And then we bring an uh, atomically sharp STM tip close to the proximity of the sample surface so that uh, the tip and the sample is in the electrical tunneling region when we apply a uh, bias voltage across this junction. So using the uh, tunneling current as the feedback signal, the STM tip raster scans the surface and generate STM images. Because the STM tip is atomically sharp and the tunneling current has a very strong dependence on the tip sample distance, these STM images usually show atomic resolution. That's why we can use STM to observe atomic scale material properties. Also, we can use a related technique, so-called scanning tunneling spectroscopy, to get uh, more details about the local electron properties of the sample surface. In the next, I would like to give a few examples to uh, illustrate our uh, surface science studies on the metal halide provoskites. The first example is our STM study to determine atomic structure of the metal halide provoskite single crystal samples. And this study was uh, mainly carried out by uh, Robin and uh, Louis. And I see Louis uh, sitting over there. And uh, this collaboration, uh, oh, this is also a collaboration work with uh, strong support from Professor Nangyu Park uh, from SKKU in South Korea, and Professor Lee's group uh, in Suzhou University in China provided DFT calculation support for this work. For this study, uh, we realized that the most important prerequisite to obtain atomic resolution STM images is to prepare a clean, atomically flat sample surface. So our strategy uh, was to grow Provoskite single crystals using the reported solvent exchange method. The size of these single crystals growing by this method can range from a few millimeters up to one centimeter. We then mount one of uh, such single crystal sample to the sample holder and transfer it to our uh, ultra-high vacuum system. And finally, we used a knife to perform a vacuum cleavage uh, of these single crystal samples and uh, successfully obtained a uh, clean, atomically flat uh, sample surface. Then we performed STM studies on these single crystal samples. The, uh, the model uh, shown on the left uh, is the uh, typical crystal structures of the Provoska materials. And in the case of MAPBBR3, uh, each of the 
PB uh, lead uh, ion is surrounded by six uh, bromine ions, forming the so-called PBBr6 uh, octahedron. Then eight of uh, such octahedra form a cage, uh, at the center of which the Ma cation uh, is located. By comparing the experimental STM image with the DFT simulation results, we were able to determine that these white protrusions on the STM image obtained on the reconstructed uh, surface of single crystals are all bromine ions, which form a characteristic uh, dimer structure. On the other hand, uh, because the Ma cation has a much lower surface density of states than the bromine ions, under the typical uh, STM uh, operation condition, they cannot be observed. When we scanned uh, much larger regions of the uh, sample surface, we uh, find many regions with uh, perfect uh, lattice and almost defect-free. So here in this example, we can see everywhere shows the uh, characteristic bromine dimer structure. On the other hand, when we scanned some other regions of the sample surface, uh, we observed the defects. For example, in this image here, the dark depressions are uh, point defects. As you can see from the uh, line profile on the bottom, at the uh, defect site, the STM height is lower than the surrounding region by about uh, 0.3 angstrom. Another observation of our STM study is that, on average, the density of point defects is below 1% with respect to the uh, total number of the uh, bromine surface ions. In the next example, I would like to introduce to you the STM studies on the mixed halide provost guides. And this study was uh, performed by, uh, mainly by Jeremy uh, in collaboration with Professor Yan Fa Yan uh, from University of Toledo and also received strong support from Professor Aito Mongoza. So first of all, why we are interested in the mixed halide provost guides? Uh, this is because these uh, mixed halide compositions can enable us to have multiple uh, advantages, uh, such as band gap tuning and beta stability, but there were also several puzzles pending for these mixed halide provost guides, such as what is the uh, surface structure and uh, what is the mechanism for stability improvements. For this study, we used two types of the sample operation method uh, to prepare our samples. The first method is uh, the previously used vacuum cleavage of the Provoskai single crystal samples. And the second method is the uh, uh, shown here. As you can see, it's a dual source co-evaporation method to evaporate two precursors. These two precursors will arrive at the substrate and react with each other to form the Provoskai thin film. The film thickness uh, can be precisely monitored by these uh, microbalance uh, sensors and uh, we usually um, grow uh, provoscite thin films with a typical film thickness of a few nanometers. The uh, film thickness here uh, is to ensure uh, we uh, minimize the uh, subject effect while still ensuring the stable STM operation. By comparing very thoroughly uh, on the STM uh, imaging uh, results obtained on both type of samples, either uh, uh, vacuum cleaved uh, single crystal sample or uh, in situ grown thin film sample, we found that uh, the results were highly coherent. Therefore, in the following dis discussion, I will not differentiate between these two types of uh, samples. In this study, the first sample I, uh, we uh, scanned are the uh, pure MABR3 uh, provost guide uh, sample. The top image is the uh, experimental STM image, and the bottom is the uh, simulated image according to the DFT calculations. As you can see, uh, once again, we observed the characteristic uh, repeating bromine dimer structure, and the top uh, experimental image agrees quite well with the simulation image. Then, by vacuum deposition of a small amount of PBI2, we substituted uh, part of the bromine surface ions with the iodine ions. Because iodine ions uh, have a larger ion radius, uh, they appear as the bright protrusions in the STM image. On the other hand, um, by vacuum deposition of a small amount of the PBCL2, 
uh, we substituted part of the bromine surface ion with a chlorine ion because chlorine ions have a, a smaller ion radius than the bromine ions, they appear as dark depressions in the STM image. Then we scanned uh, larger regions of all these three samples, try to uh, uh, determine whether these additional deposited uh, halide ions, they form any specific uh, ordered structure. So the top row shows here the large area scan STM experimental image for all these three samples. The bottom uh, row shows the corresponding fast Fourier transformed images. As you can see, uh, for both type of the mixed halide uh, Provoskite samples, there are no additional new spots. Uh, this suggests that the newly deposited halide ions are randomly distributed. There are no uh, phase segregation for these uh, uh, additional ions. To uh, further understand the impact of the, um, uh, the halide mixing, uh, our theory collaborators also calculated the decomposition energy, which is an indicator for material uh, stability. So in the case of the incorporating of the iodine ions into the MAPB-BR3 uh, surface, uh, we found that the surface stability decreases monotonically as the surface uh, iodine uh, ratio increases. And this suggests that incorporation of iodine ions on the surface of MAPB-BR3 decreases the surface uh, stability. On the other hand, when we uh, try to substitute part of the uh, surface bromine ions with the chlorine ions, we find that the surface stability uh, first increases until it reaches a uh, maximum and uh, at about 15% uh, of the chlorine uh, concentration. So this uh, suggests that indeed a suitable amount of chlorine ion can improve the Provoskite film uh, surface stability our X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy experiments also confirmed this finding. In our follow-up study, which is uh, uh, performed by FCN, uh, together with a collaboration from Professor Ying, uh, we also observed the similar results for another Provoska material, MAPB-I3. So, uh, as I mentioned in one of the previous slides, uh, one of the uh, pending challenges for Provoska solar cells are they are relatively uh, short lifetime. So to get a better understanding about this issue, we studied the effect of iron, uh, uh, iodine vapor on the iodine containing provoskite and observed accelerated degradation. And this study was performed by Sheng Hao. So in the next couple of slides, I would like to use the uh, cartoon animation to illustrate uh, such effects. So here is a uh, structure of Provoskai solar cell, and it has multiple layers of functional materials. At the center of uh, the cell is the photoabsorbing layer, which in this case is the MAPBI3 Provoskite. Now let's zoom into this layer to visualize the microscopic uh, picture of the self-degradation mechanism, uh, which is the main conclusion derived from our study here. So uh, in the uh, solar cell operation, uh, light incident on the solar cell, part of the light will be converted into the electricity by the solar cell, but a larger portion of the remaining light will turn into the uh, heat, which lead to the uh, increase of the cell temperature and cause the initial degradation of the provoskite uh, layer uh, in a local scale. Also, the uh, provoskite solar cell is operated in the ambient condition. So the ambient uh, gas molecules such as water and oxygen can interact with the provoskite layer, also causing the initial degradation of uh, provoskite. And a uh, byproduct of the uh, initial degradation is iodine 2. The iodine 2 is quite diffusive and can migrate to other regions of provoskite layer, lead to the further degradation of the provoskite. As a result, iodine 2, uh, more iodine 2 is generated and so on and so forth. Such degradation events will finally lead to the uh, degradation of provoskite layer at a much larger scale. And eventually, the uh, performance of these uh, provoskite solar cell will deteriorate. In this study, we not only look at the uh, 
um, MA PBI3 provost guide, but also look at uh, many other kinds of provost guide materials. Uh, what we find that is uh, for uh, all the provost guide materials that contains iodine, uh, the uh, iodine vapor exposure lead to the faster uh, degradation. Uh, but when we performed uh, similar studies on the MAPB BR3, that is replacing the uh, halide composition in provost guide structure from the, uh, from the iodine to the bromine, we found that the MAPB BR3 shows much better stability against either the uh, iodine 2 vapor uh, exposure or bromine 2 uh, pr uh, vapor pressure. So this provides us with additional insight that Halide composition can indeed have a very vital impact on the stability of provost guide materials. The other aspect that need to be uh, addressed prior to the uh, large area or large scale deployment of provost guide solar cell is that how can we uh, make large area provost guide solar cell while maintaining their high performance. So in the previous slide I showed the uh, best uh, research cell efficiency chart, and the uh, provost guide solar cell has already reached a very high efficiency exceeding 26%. But please note that this high efficiency is only achieved on a small area uh, research cell with a typical um, size of about 0.1 centimeter square or even smaller. For, on the other hand, for the practical applications, a size of about one meter square is usually required. So here we see a size gap of about five orders of magnitude. That is why uh, it is very important to upscale provost guide uh, solar cell fabrication. So in the past few years, we have uh, made uh, very dedicated efforts towards this direction and fabricated five by five, 10 by 10, and 15 by 15 uh, provost guide solar modules. In the next couple of slides, I would like to uh, show you uh, several examples of uh, such efforts. In the first example, uh, we developed a so-called uh, holistic approach to interface stabilization for fabricating large area uh, provost guide solar modules. And this study uh, was performed by uh, Zhong Hao and Long Bing. For each of the uh, interfaces and uh, uh, surfaces in the provost guide solar module uh, structure, uh, they applied a certain uh, strategy to optimize. And as a result, we could obtain the provost guide solar module on an area of 22.4 centimeter square, not only showing a high efficiency 16.6%, but also demonstrating stable operation for 2,000 hours. In a more recent study, which was performed by uh, Tong Le, uh, Tong Le uh, introduced the MACL as additive into the provost guide precursor solution to modulate crystal growth of the provost guide thin films. And uh, by combining uh, this strategy with uh, several surface and bulk passivation methods, he was able to obtain high quality uh, provost guide thin film on a much larger scale using a doctor blade coating, which is a scalable fabrication method. As a result, we were able to obtain a provost guide solar sub-module with uh, area exceeding 200 centimeters square with a uh, efficiency 15.3%. To summarize, in this talk here, I have shown you uh, using surface sciences as a very strong uh, tool, we uh, understand much better about, surface, uh, about the surface and also structure and property relationships of the uh, metal halide provost guide material. And furthermore, we apply these surface science findings in our solar cell uh, and obtain some very interesting uh, applications. Uh, with that, I would like to close my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have plenty of time for some questions, like if anyone would like to ask Yabing some questions. Thank, thanks, Yabing. It's always amazing to see your productivity and all, all the beautiful results. Uh, how easy is it to scale this up to the one meter scale that you mentioned? The uh, first question and second question is the 3D structure, would that be helpful? Uh, 3D structure. 3D, so you talked about 2D structure here, surface structure, but would 3D structure be uh. also helpful? 
Very good. So uh, essentially, uh, two questions. The first question is about uh, you know further uh, upscaling, and uh, yes and no. You know, our motivation is always try to get the bigger and bigger. Probably try to bridge the uh, uh, you know the size gap eventually to uh, one meter square. Uh, but also there's a limitation. I think uh, even you know when we see the uh, solar modules are made from the crystalline silicon cells. Actually, uh, the panel is not a single uh, module. They actually uh, contains uh, multiple modules together. So my guess is that, you know, I'm not sure about the proposed gas solar cell. Probably it's a very similar strategy. In the end, uh, is for each of module, probably it's up to, say, for example, 30 centimeter uh, by 30 centimeter square, you know, and then you put the, all these modules together and forming a large area, one meter square uh, solar panel. And that could be the case. And also, I would like to highlight, you know, for this kind of uh, uh, approach and also the efforts, probably it's not only, uh, I would say, more efficiently done by collaboration uh, between the academia and also industry as well. It cannot uh, be achieved solely by the uh, research groups in the universities. Uh, the second one is about the three-dimensional structures, right? And indeed, uh, if you look at uh, all the aspects I have shown here, maybe more than 95% I'm talking about the surfaces, right? There are two reasons for that, okay? First is because surfaces are important. Well, I mean, that goes without uh, uh, any doubt, right? And because if you even look at the very simple structure of the proposed sky solar cell, there are already five, six interfaces. Okay, and plus, if you think about these uh, uh, provoskite uh, layer, there is not a single crystalline, and intrinsically they have grand boundaries, and grand boundary can also be regarded as a interface in some sense. So uh, the main reason, or the first reason, I would say, is because interfaces are important. Uh, secondly, is uh, so far you know uh, our technique, uh, you know at least the ones I'm using, the scanning tunneling microscopy and the UPS, XPS, spectroscopy, is possible to scan or to probe up to, say for example, a few nanometers uh, go into the bulk, okay? So there's also a little bit of technical limitation for these tools, but I'm not uh, suggesting <laughs> the bulk uh, properties are not important. Actually, they are probably also important, probably equally important, uh, together with uh, surface uh, properties, uh, but probably will need to, to develop some innovative uh, technology and also um, tools for enhancing our capability, which is also uh, some of the uh, our group members are trying to make efforts. Um, so I have two questions, Ya Bing. So one is you mentioned this efficiency about 26%, and that's considered to be high. Uh, I, I'm just curious, so, so what's the limitation? Let's say if you, you can overcome all the technical challenges, yeah. uh, what kind of percentage would so, be? Um, this might be the best we go back to the uh, research yeah, uh, cell efficiency chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, you will see uh, there are a few uh, type of solar cells they can achieve higher. even much higher <laughs> efficiency than proposed kind of solar cells. And let me try to uh, clarify, you know, what are these uh, uh, solar cells, you know, for instance, you know, for the up there, you know, these uh, solar cells, uh, especially the top few, uh, these are called multi-junction solar cells. They are basically combining single junction uh, solar cells together, each junction focusing a certain wavelength, try to get the best efficiency for that particular wavelength. Mm -hmm. So that's why it can reach much higher efficiency. But ca uh, as you can imagine, the uh, kind of fabrication uh, procedure is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. And plus, for these uh, uh, solar cells to work, they also use some special materials, and these materials is uh, generally much more expensive than the provost kind of solar cell and also silicon cells as well. So here, uh, in the sense, you know, of the how can you determine uh, what is the right type of the uh, solar cell, it really depends on application. If you focus on the, for example, the larger air deployment mm -hmm. uh, on the earth, right, put on the roof, then the lower cost we must take into account. Right. But on the other hand, for, for example, outer space, right, the spaceship, right, they really have limited uh, small space for uh, mounting a solar cell, probably efficiency is impo more important. And uh, Yeah, the, so considering uh, the Okinawan, like a local environment, 
you know, with typhoon, rainy seasons, and you know, high salt concentration. Uh, have you tried to test uh, your solar cells, like in the real environment? Uh, how how does that perform? Excellent question. Yes. Uh, um, in the uh, past few years, you know, uh, I uh, was really engaged in the discussion of doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that it's not that simple, okay? <laughs> Okinawa usually, uh, you know, has uh, very good sunny days, but also uh, very uh, kind of uh, rainy days, uh, rainy season, mm -hmm. which make the uh, measurement of these uh, solar cells not that straightforward. We have to uh, really um, kind of uh, encapsulate the measuring device, probably uh, especially the electronic part in a case so that uh, it will not be damaged during the uh, running season. But it is possible. Okay. And there so, are so they can be that. easily damaged. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, okay. the sales, I think, uh, in the end, has to be uh, durable right. for the, um, you know, um, the field uh, applications mm -hmm. outside, right? Yes. Uh, but for uh, doing these things, uh, you know, electronics in our lab probably mm -hmm. first have to okay. really make that Water compatible. And, yes. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, and congratulations. So uh, if I remember correctly, when you came to OIST, you were working on like a, a organic uh, uh, solar cells. And then how could you quickly shift to this uh, perovskite uh, type of uh, uh, solar cells? And the answer is yes. Yes, I worked on the organic solar cells at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, well, it was, uh, I would say it was more like uh, take advantage of the uh, uh, the opportunity because at that time, you know, I kind of uh, obtained quite in-depth understanding about organic solar cells mm -hmm. and the new type of material, Provoska, just uh, came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of uh, try to see, you know, whether in this new type of solar cell yeah. uh, can overcome the limitations of organic solar cell, which at that time had a very serious stagnation in their efficiency. It was uh, kind of like kept as a constant for, for uh, 14, 13 percent for a very long time. But once again, um, I mean, nobody knows. <laughs> Nowadays, I think uh, since about maybe three, four years uh, back, uh, researchers find a new class of the materials, organic materials. Oh, really? Now the efficiency is indeed oh. much higher than the previously uh, 13, 14 percent. Okay. So organic solar cells become also a strong uh, candidate for the next generation solar cells. Okay. So probably my best answer is uh, uh, nobody can predict what will be the winning you know, technology in the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably the best strategy is we have to keep eye on all these parallel uh, developing technologies of the solar cells. Yeah. And probably your expert, uh, expertise in uh, uh, fine measurement uh, of the surface uh, was a good advantage, I guess. Right. Yeah. For the uh, organic solar cells, uh, the surfaces are even more important mm -hmm. because compared to the Provoska solar cell, the layers are typically hundreds of the nanometers. Mm -hmm. uh, organic solar cells typically uh, 50 nanometer, uh -huh. sometimes even 30 nanometer is even much thinner. Mm -hmm. And talking about the surface to the bulk ratio is even much higher. Uh -huh. So I uh, agree with you, probably the importance of the surface in organic solar cell development is even more important than Provoska solar cells. And one other question. So this uh, perovskite includes uh, lead. Ah. Can that cause uh, environmental concern when they are disposed? It is a very open uh, question for discussion, actually. So nobody has reached the conclusion yet. Uh -huh. There are uh, very serious calculations calculating, you know, how you know this will happen if uh, you know Provoskite solar module breaks uh, when it's outside, right? And even in our own group. We uh, actually developed a, a encapsulation technology mm -hmm. in 2019 just to simulate in the extreme weather condition mm -hmm. if the Provoskai solar cell breaks uh, during, say, for example, the hail, right? The big ice ball uh, hitting on the uh, solar panel makes that a break, you know, and the lead will come out as a leakage, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for that type of, uh, you know, uh, method, we developed a so-called self-healing uh, encapsulant. Mm -hmm. which is a polymer material, mm -hmm. and uh, if it's uh, broken at room temperature, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, it might uh, ha cause the problem. Mm -hmm. But the uh, nice part about that, if the uh, weather gets better, for example, the next day, you know, uh, it's a warm temperature, right? Like, uh, you know, 40, 30, uh, 40 uh, degree can be reached, it will be uh, self-healed. Uh -huh. 
and then that very effectively um, prevent the uh, leakage of the uh, lead, uh, uh, lead uh, you know, into the soil and the water, etc. Okay. Yeah, but but this is a pending, I think, a discussion hasn't been uh, completely, I think, uh, agreed on uh, in uh, consensus. Okay, thank you very much. If maybe I can ask one question to close out, and then we can go on to the tea time. But how long do you think until we have pescovite panels covering a house like you showed at the end? I mean, what, how far out are we from that? If you look at the, the development, I think the main challenge is a lifetime. If we can overcome the bottleneck of the lifetime, we can have that in a reasonable period of time, I would say up to five years. But if that cannot be overcome, as many other technologies, it comes and goes. So I think the key really is how can we understand better about the degradation mechanism? How can we circumvent this as the uh, biggest challenge for provost guy solar technology? So this is also one of the main topics actually in our group. We are still making a big effort towards that direction. Thank you very much. So let's uh, thank Yabing again for the wonderful talk. Thank you. And, um